Praise the Lord. Jai Masi Sabko and uh, welcome everyone to class. Sorry, I had to repeat the welcome because I was un unmuted and I was speaking. Um, thank you all for joining uh, class um, and uh, we'll begin. Can I ask one of our online students to lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Online students? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, commit this time of uh, study into thy hands and we pray, Father, that whatever we learn today, we will not only be able to retain, but apply it in our day-to-day -day lives, Father. We pray, Father, that um, you'll also bless all the teachers and all the students. And we, we thank you for your precious word, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. I really appreciate your ever readiness to lead in prayer, whether it's mentoring hour or uh, even in class. I just really appreciate that. It's something really nice about you. Thank you. Okay, so we were studying which chapter? Chapter 4, okay. And what are we looking at in Chapter 4? Uh, the prophecies concerning the... The promise of his coming, okay, that is the title of the chapter, yes. Uh, what are we studying in this chapter? Hello, what are we studying in this chapter? We're studying about the covenants, prophecies, okay, the Old Testament prophecies. Okay, if it's fulfilled by Jesus, what are the prophecies that we are looking at? Well, none of you went through your notes, I think. What are the prophecies we are looking at in chapter 4? No, I, uh, I'm asking what are we, what prophecies? There are many prophecies regarding various things in the Old Testament. But what are we looking specifically about? Prophecies concerning the? The birth of Christ, thank you, Lucy. The incarnation of Jesus Christ. Okay, the incarnation. So I think none of you have looked through your notes. There's a big question mark and a big puzzle, and some of you are giving me very sweet smiles. Anyways, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, right? Sorry. I'll just uh, close this otherwise. Yeah. We'll have a lot of background noise, yeah. Okay, so we're looking at the the prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus Christ, okay, or the incarnation of Christ. When we talk about incarnation, what do we mean? God, God taking the form of man, God becoming man, okay. So we looked at various prophecies and we were looking at the eighth prophecy uh, we were considering in the Old Testament, that is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, so can somebody read that again, please? Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Thank you. So who is the messenger here? My messenger in the beginning of the verse? John the Baptist. Okay. So how do we know it's John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist was the one who was going to prepare the way for whom? For Jesus. Okay. We look at this uh, prophecy also in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Uh, what does Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 say? Can somebody read that please? And somebody else can turn to Luke chapter 1 verse 76. And somebody else can turn to John chapter 1 verse 23. So we can have somebody read Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Anyone ready to read Isaiah 40 verse 3? 
can pass the mic around so others can okay you can read can it uh, it, yes go ahead lucy as a chapter chapter 40 verse 3 the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make straight in the desert a highway for our god okay so here um isaiah is prophesying about this messenger who would come and prepare the way for jesus and how do we know it's john the baptist uh, look at what luke chapter 1 verse 76 says and you child will be called the prophet of the highest for you will go before the face of the lord to prepare his ways yeah so it's talking about whom here talking about john the baptist and John the Baptist himself in John chapter 1, verse 23. Sir, can somebody read that? John is talking about and quoting Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Can somebody read that? Give it to Nelson, the mic. He can read it. He okay. said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Yes. So here we see that the uh, the messenger here is referring to John the Baptist. Okay, and then it says in uh, Malachi chapter three verse one, and the Lord whom you will seek will suddenly come to his temple. Okay, so who is the Lord here? It's talking about referring to whom? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, when did he come suddenly into the temple? We the fulfillment of this uh, seems to be referring to John chapter 2 verses 14 to 14 and 15. John chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. What happens in John, the latter half of John chapter 2? Jesus is in the temple and what is he doing? When the business and all yes. Go ahead, Lucy. He, uh, when they were doing the wrong things in the temple, selling and buying, he overthrew all those things and uh, he wanted to set it clear. Okay, he cleansed the temple, he cleared it of all the uh, the business transactions that were happening and he cleared the temple. So when Jesus comes to clear the temple of those who are selling the sheep, cattle and doves. Okay, so here if you notice in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, it says that Jesus is the messenger of the Covenant. Which covenant? Old covenant? He's a messenger of what? He's a messenger of the covenant. Jesus, yes, came to fulfill the old covenant. Because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Someone else can turn to Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 to 13. Okay, so what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Yes, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I have come to fulfill it. Okay, and he came to uh, fulfill the old covenant. He also came to usher in the new covenant okay uh, look at what hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 to 13 says can somebody please read that hebrews, hebrews? Oh, please go ahead go, go ahead uh, sanjay hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 to 13 sorry uh, yes you're right In hebrews 8 6 to 13, 6 to 13. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, says the Lord. 
For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, and their lawlessness and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Amen. Thank you. Um, sorry. Yeah. So here we see that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Okay. He's a mediator of the new um, covenant. Now, uh, when Jesus was a mediator of the new covenant or he brought about the new covenant, is the old covenant bad or what do you think? Why was there a need for a new covenant? Was the old covenant not good enough? It just, show, it just uh, showcased the man's depravity of not living up to the law. Okay, it so, shows the man's um, inability to live up to the law. Okay. And he just came to uphold the new covenant. Okay, right. Came to uphold the new covenant. Uh, Paul, uh, when he's ex talking about the law in Romans, he says, you know, um, the law is good. Okay, the, he's talking about the old covenant law, the Old Testament law. He says the law is good. There's nothing wrong with the law, but it's we as people who are not able to keep the law. It's our own frailty. And that is why we uh, read in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, God says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will write my laws upon your heart and mind and I will put my spirit in you and my spirit will cause you to keep my laws. So it was not that the old law which God gave or the old covenant was in any way, um, you know, falling short of what God wanted it, so he wanted a new covenant. No, it was because we were not able to keep up with the old covenant. We were not able to keep the uh, law. Okay, So he came to establish the new covenant, and the new covenant is established on better promises. Why on better promises? What is a better promises? What is the old covenant based on? What are the promises based on the for the old covenant? It was based on our doing. Yes. New covenant is based on what the Lord has done for us. What Jesus has done on the cross. Yes. Thank you so much. So the old covenant is basically if you don't keep all of these laws, all of these curses will follow. Right? We see that in Deuteronomy. So it was based on us trying to keep the law and then God realized that these people really can't keep and that's why he said I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh I will write my laws upon your heart and mind and I will put my spirit so Holy Spirit who will help us to keep God's uh, covenant or his promises okay the new covenant is built on better promises why because it is depending on the finished work of Jesus Christ, it is by grace through faith and not by works, okay? And it's the Holy Spirit who will enable us, the Holy Spirit who comes and indwells in each one of us, the Holy Spirit who helps us, okay? What was the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? How was the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Coming and going? <laughs> yeah, that's the right way of looking at it, coming and going. Sorry. Okay, only when uh, he would come and go, Andrew also says, okay, uh, it's not that he'll come to earth and then go back to heaven, no. Come and go means he would come, he will come on a person, 
till that person finishes that specific assignment. So for a limited extent of time and specific people, he would come on. And when the assignment is completed, he would leave them. Okay, not come and go. He would come and infill them or indwell in them or empower them. And then he would leave them. Okay, but how is the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? What does Jesus say? The Holy Spirit will come and dwell in you. And he's for? a comforter. He's a comforter, but the Holy Spirit will come and indwell in you for ever. John Hello. chapter 14 and John chapter 16, we read that. Okay. So here we see that, you know, um, Jesus came to establish the new covenant. Okay. I'm not going to look at what are the difference, uh, differences between the old and new covenant because you have a topic on uh, covenants, you will be studying that in um, detail. Okay. But just to know for you to know that Jesus uh, initiated or is the one who's a mediator of the new covenant. Mediator means what? Sorry? Intermediator. What does a mediator mean? Between God and man. Okay, so when God made the covenant in the Old Testament, he made it with Abraham, God with Abraham, God with Noah, God with Moses, God with the people of Israel. Okay, uh, the next prophecy we would look at is uh, the ninth one is um, the Lord's servant in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1, 6, and 7. So, can somebody read that, please? Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1. Six and seven. Yes, Andrew, thank you. Uh, Andrew says the mediator is one who stands in the gap. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the Gentiles. Verse 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, those who sit in, the, in darkness from the prison house. Amen. Thank you. So here it's talking in Isaiah chapter 42, it's talking about the Lord ser Lord's servant. Okay, look at what it says in verse 1. Behold my servant. Okay. And the M is a capital M. So who is it referring to? Who is it referring to? My. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1. Behold my servant. Who is the my? Okay, thank you, Sanjay. It's God. Elect, my elect. God, my father. Okay, or God the father. Okay. And who is the servant here? Jesus my servant. Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ, because there again you see a capital S, it's not a small S. Okay, how many servant songs? This is called as a servant song. Isaiah chapter 42 is called as a servant song. How many servant songs are there in Isaiah? Anyone knows? Okay, there are four servant songs in Isaiah. Okay, very characteristic of uh, Jesus, uh, prophecies concerning uh, Jesus. So uh, very important. It's called as servant songs. Uh, there are four servant songs in the book of Isaiah. And the servant here is referring to Jesus. How do we know it's referring here to Jesus? Look at what Acts chapter 3 verse 13 says. Acts chapter 3 verse 13. Can somebody read that please? Acts chapter 3, 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. Yes. So here uh, in Acts chapter 3, we see that Peter is preaching this uh, sermon, and it's through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, he's referring to Jesus as whom? Yes. Glorified his servant, Jesus. Okay. So here the servant songs are basically in Isaiah's referring to, um, to Jesus. Do you want to know where are the other servant songs? 
Yes, no? Anyone interested? Okay, the first servant song is in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 4. All these are not in your notes. I'm just giving you extra so you can take it down. Second one is Isaiah 49, 1 to 6. The third servant song is Isaiah 54 to 9. And the fourth servant song is Isaiah 52, 13, chapter, verse 13 to chapter 53, verse 12. Isaiah 52, verse 13 to chapter 2, chapter 53, verse 12. I'll repeat that again. Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. Isaiah 49, 1 to 6. Isaiah 54 to 9. Isaiah 52, verse 13 to chapter 53, verse 12. So these are the four servant songs we find in the book of uh, Isaiah. And we see that the servant here we know is talking about Jesus because even uh, Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 33 verse 13 refers to Jesus as the servant. Okay, And um, we notice also that Jesus himself, it says here that, you know, um, uh, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, and whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Okay, so we see that um, you know Isaiah also talks about uh, the about this uh, Messiah who is going to come in Isaiah chapter sixty-one verses one to three, where it says, "The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the." poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and open up the prison doors to those who are bound. And he goes on uh, in verse 2 and 3 um, to declare even more what the Messiah would do. But look at what Jesus himself proclaims in about himself when he comes uh, to the temple in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Can somebody read that, please? Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So here we read that you know, Jesus himself is saying, hey, you know, what was prophesied about me in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 3 and also Isaiah chapter 42 uh, verse 6 or verse 1, sorry, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and I'm here to do what was fulfilled um, by God or uh, revealed through the prophets in the Old Testament. We will look at three things that we can uh, gather insights from uh, this servant song in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1, 6, and 7 will notice three important facts about the servant. The first thing is the servant, who is referred to as Jesus Christ, was to be given as a covenant to the people. Okay, It refers to Jesus coming and being the mediator of the new covenant, or it is referring to Jesus you know, bringing about the new covenant that he came to give us okay and we notice that the servant himself was to be given as a covenant so jesus himself was to be given as a covenant because it says in um, in isaiah chapter 42 was um yeah in verse 6 it says um, and I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the Gentiles. Okay, And so we see this, that uh, scripture teaches us that Jesus was the one who came to establish the new covenant. And why does it say here that I will give you as a covenant to the people? Why does it say that Jesus himself was given as a covenant? Why doesn't it say Jesus came and established a 
new covenant? Or why does why shouldn't it have said that Jesus came as the mediator of the new covenant? Why does it say here that Jesus himself was given as a covenant? Any idea? Of course, he was a mediator of the new covenant. He came to establish the new covenant, but why was he given as a covenant? People who look at him and see him as an example, okay? He is the one who was crucified for us. Okay, so he was crucified means what? So this is a, God sent his son okay. for our sins. No? So he himself was the covenant. So his finished work at the cross emphasizes that, you know, this is the covenant and through him, the new covenant is established. Okay, so it was established through his? Finished work of the cross. Okay, through his blood. If you notice in the old covenant, every time a covenant was made, what was sacrificed? Uh, it an animal, a lamb was sacrificed, and it was established in blood. Okay, blood for blood. So in those days, the tradition was in the old testament, uh, old testament times, the the um, the whole ritual was that if two people were making a covenant, they would actually cut their vein here, and both of them would keep their hands like this. Okay, so their blood would bleed, and both of them would making the covenant would keep a promise or binding covenant or binding promise would keep their hand like this and say blood for blood which means hey if you fail to keep this promise that we both are going to keep taking an oath then if you fail i have the right to take your life if you don't uh, if i don't keep the covenant i have the right to you know for you to take my life if you don't take keep the covenant i have the right to take your life so blood for blood but when god made the covenant with noah with um, abraham with moses every time there was an animal that was sacrificed an unblemished lamb so here we see that when jesus came he not only was a mediator between the between god and us in establishing the new covenant not only was he the one who was the one who established the new covenant but he was also someone who was given as the uh, you know was given as a covenant which means he, he was that fully full perfect sufficient sacrifice the unblemished lamb of god that was sacrificed and through his blood he established the new covenant okay so we see that scripture teaches us that you know jesus was the one who established a new covenant and he's a priest who also officiates which means oversees performs a duty in the new covenant by the sprinkling of blood okay uh, we look at this prophecy which is mentioned in isaiah chapter 52 verse 15 can somebody read that please Isaiah 52, verse 15. And somebody else can open to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. Can I read, Sister? Yes. Sure, please go ahead, get Sister Gertrude. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So here we see that Jesus not only was given as a new covenant, not only one who established a new covenant, he's also the priest who officiates or oversees or performs the duty of the new covenant by the sprinkling of the blood. Okay, so how is he as a priest, uh, you know, um, the sprinkling of the blood, what does it mean? You know, in the Old Testament times, uh, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle, whenever the priest made a sacrifice he would take that blood and sprinkle it and all the items on the in the tabernacle and also on the people and when he went into the holy of holies once a year he would sprinkle the blood and you know in the holy of holies as well which means the blood was something that would cover their sin so jesus was the one you know who was the priest even now you know why do we uh, uh, why are we living by grace is because Jesus is our officiating high priest. He's a high priest who's in not only interceding on behalf of the Father, but he's a high priest when we 
sin, you know, God the Father automatically pronounces the punishment. So what comes out is punishment, but what comes out of that punishment is grace because it is Jesus who's saying, you know, I have uh, I have shed my blood for Selina's sin. So what comes out is grace and forgiveness. Isn't that wonderful? It's not that God the Father has changed. No, when he sees sin, he immediately, you know, punishes sin. The punishment is pronounced. But what comes out, what we receive is grace. Is because Jesus is our great interceding high priest in heaven now. He's interceding on behalf of us. He's officiating in front, uh, uh, on behalf of us. He's saying, Father, forgive her, forgive him, because I've already paid the price. So that is why we, John says, you know, I see in the middle of the throne of uh, heaven, uh, before the throne of God, I see a, a, a lamb that looks like it was sacrificed. So who is that lamb that looks like this was sacrificed? Jesus, okay? So he's still our officiating high priest, okay? And um, so we see that, you know, uh, the new covenant was officiated by the sprinkling of his own blood. Look at what Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 to 15 says. Everyone was, is understanding? Yeah, I'm going slow so that you can understand. Anyone has any doubts, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or, you know, post it on the chat section or you can ask the question. Okay, Hebrews 9, 11 to 15. Can somebody read that, please? But when the Messiah arrived, high priest of the superior things of this new covenant, he bypassed the old tent and its trappings in its created world and went straight into heaven's tent, the true holy place, once and for all. He also bypassed the sacrifices consisting of goat and calf blood, instead using his own blood as the price to set us free once and for all. If that animal blood and the other rituals of purification were effective in cleaning up certain matters of our religion and behavior, Think how much more the blood of Christ cleanses up our whole lives, inside and out. Through the Spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice, freeing us from all those dead end efforts to make ourselves respectable, so that we can live all out for God. Amen. What a, a beautiful verse, verses these are. It says, but Christ came as a high priest okay uh, of the good things to come um, and it says he came not with the blood of goats and calves okay not like the other priests who officiated in the in the temple or before that in the tabernacle but jesus uh, you know entered the most holy place through his own blood Okay, so we know that on the day of atonement, you know, the, the, the high priest was chosen to go into the holy of holies. And on that day, two sacrifices, two animals were sacrificed. One to sacrifice for the sins of the uh, people and one this priest would sacrifice for himself. And the other one was a scapegoat that they would send out into the wilderness. They would lay the sins of all the people uh, on that scapegoat and we'll, we'll study this and they would send it out. And the other that the sacrifice was the blood that would cover the sins of the priest and the uh, people. And before entering the Holy of Holies, you know, the, the priest would sprinkle that blood and also sprinkle upon himself and, you know, so that he is covered and he can enter the Holy of Holies. So here you see that, you know, if he doesn't do it in the right way, then when he enters the Holy of Holies, what happens? He could even be, he could drop down dead, okay, because, you know, he, he cannot enter the, the Holy Presence of um, God. But here we see that Jesus entered the most holy place, talking about the holy of holies, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Okay. And that is why we, when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? What happened in the temple? When Jesus died on the cross, what happened in the temple? The veil was torn into two. Yeah. What is that veil? Uh, that is. Okay, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Okay, that separated us from God. Only there in the Holy of Holies was the 
uh, the Ark of the Covenant kept and God's presence would come between those two uh, in the, the angels, the cherubims, which were on the ark, the lid of the ark of the covenant, and God would speak to the high, the high priest who would come there and give him instructions for the people. But people could not see it because of that curtain that was drawn. So when Jesus died, he established a new covenant, and Jesus is saying, "I am your officiating high priest, and now you can, you know, you don't need access." through the priest to go into the Holy of Holies, because it's my blood. My blood has, you know, um, brought about um, a purification of your sins and redemption. And, you know, that's why it says here in verse 15. And for he, this reason, he's a mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Okay. So we have the access into the Holy of because the curtain was thrown to two, that means we have access uh, between man has access uh, to God and does not need to go through a human high priest. Okay, isn't that beautiful that Jesus himself is now our officiating um, high priest and by his blood he has made it, uh, made that access and that's why we can boldly enter the throne of grace so that we can receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need as the writer of hebrews says all of you with me yes <coughs> sorry and we also read that you know jesus is the testator of the new covenant he's a testator or the one who dies to make the covenant effective okay now what is the meaning of testator jesus is the testator of the new covenant Basically, testator means a person, you know, who leaves a, a will, you know, a person who uh, dies leaving a will or a, 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 a testament that can be enforced now because he is dead. Okay. Now, for example, your parents can leave a will, okay, write a will, and if they have property, they can leave it. But when does, and they become a testator. That means they are the ones who are making that will or that uh, testament. Okay. And when does that come into effect? When does that will come into effect? After the death of the person. After the death of the testator or of the, after the, uh, the, the death of the person who makes that will. Okay. So here we see that Jesus is the testator of the new covenant. It's so beautiful because Jesus actually makes a will. He makes a will or a testament, and that will and testament can only come into force only after the person dies. So only when Jesus died, you know, we become the benefactors or we become the one who are the privileged people who are able to experience the, uh, the benefits or the will that is in the new covenant. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so here we uh, we uh, we read this in um, uh, Isaiah chapter fifty three verse eight. Can somebody read that, please? Isaiah fifty three verse eight. Isaiah fifty three uh, verse eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will de declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Amen. Thank you, Warren. So here we see that he was cut off from the land of the living. That means he died, and he died for the sins of his people. Okay, uh, look at what Hebrews chapter nine, verse sixteen and seventeen says. For where there is a testament, there must also, of necessity, be the death of, death of the testator. For a testament is in force of men are dead. Since it has no power at all while the testator leaves. Amen. So here we see that, you know, um, for where there is a testament or where there is a will or where there is a covenant, there also be, it must be, a, a, there's also necessity for the death of the testator. So who's the testator here? In Hebrews chapter 9, yes, talking about Jesus, because we read uh, Hebrews chapter 11, um, uh, 9 verses 11 to 15, okay, uh, we spoke about Jesus as a, uh, as the high priest, he was the one who uh, established a new covenant by his own blood, 
okay um, and he brought redemption through to us um, who are under the first covenant uh, so that you know through his blood we can receive the promises of the eternal inheritance which is in the new covenant and verse 16 and 17 talks about him being the testator and saying why did jesus have to die why did he have to establish you know uh, shed his blood or why did he have to die so that you know the new covenant that he makes would come into effect only after the death of the testator or the person who dies okay so verse 17 says for a testament is in force after men are dead since is since it has no power at all why the testator lives okay now the greek word for testament can be translated you know as um, a legal contract or a binding agreement okay in other words a covenant okay so here it's talking about the new covenant but the word testament here in greek can be translated uh, as a legal contract or a binding agreement okay so you look at the way the writer of hebrews is using the words he is not writing covenant here. He's talking about a testament because, you know, for the Jews, they understand testament means a will. And the will will come only into effect after the person dies. So that is why he's using the word testament, a legal contract or a binding um, agreement. So the writer of Hebrews is basically making this argument to us that just as the old covenant Okay, the old covenant was a binding agreement that was based on the blood of some animal. Okay, so also the new covenant was established in the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, and as a divine testator of the new covenant, it was absolutely necessary for Jesus, you know, um, uh, necessary that Jesus ratified that covenant for us with his own blood it was necessary for jesus to make that new covenant with his own blood why so if you people ask you why was it necessary for jesus to shed his own blood okay you can give them all of these reasons okay because he established a new covenant or a new will or a new testament and a new will and new testament can come only into effect when the person dies and also jesus made the new covenant because we were not able to keep the old covenant and he did not use any animal sacrifice jesus himself became that full sufficient perfect sacrifice so that there is no need for any more sacrifices for sins to be made or no more new covenants to be made because this was the full binding perfect covenant Okay, the sacrifice that Jesus was made was so full and sufficient that it pleased the heart of God and hence no more sacrifice needs to be made. Isn't that wonderful? You know, we are much more privileged than the Old Testament people. Yes or no? Why? Why are we more privileged than the, than the Old Testament? No need to sacrifice, okay? It's more to do with faith and belief than works in the, our flesh. Okay, more to do with faith and belief than, and it's grace, more grace than, you know, others, many of us would have fallen dead and, you know, be affected by plagues and, the, you know, uh, earth would have opened and swallowed us alive. Okay, more grace. What else? The Holy Spirit indwells in us for ever. What else? We have access before the very presence of god right which the old testament people did not have they have access before the very presence of god so you know uh, all of this should just actually help us to uh, you know look at this new covenant in a more worthy way okay like the writer of hebrew says that some of us have treated you know the in in hebrews chapter 6 he says some of us have treated the blood of the covenant as an unholy Thing and has trampled it under our feet so when we sin when we go away astray from god when we love the things of the world we're actually what are we doing we're treating the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing as something that is not is not anything valuable to us it's worthless so it's so important for us to hold these things with so much more 
or respect and not treat it as something that is unholy and unworthy. It's so important for us the way we live our lives, what we see, what we think, what we do, our actions, you know, where we go and how we live our um, lives. Okay. So we see that Jesus himself uh, is a covenant. Uh, he is the new covenant and the new covenant is embodied in the Messiah. Okay. The second thing that we can learn here um, from this um, uh, servant song that we read in Isaiah chapter 42, you know, the second important fact about the servant is that, um, yeah, that the servant was, was there to open blind eyes, bring out prisoners, you know, from the prison and those who sit in darkness out of the prison house. We already read this, right? Yes or no? Okay, when we looked at Luke chapter 4, where Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news, to set free the prisoners, recovery of the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. And we see that not only Jesus did it, but he looks upon us as his church to fulfill this even today. Okay, so it is we who have to continue proclaiming the good news, you know, because he's anointed us to set the prisoners free, you know, for those who are blinded by the things of this world and blinded from the truth of God, we speak the truth, we te preach and teach the truth, and also we set the captives and those who are oppressed by Satan, we set them free, okay? So it is we who are here to continue the work of, of uh, Jesus Christ, okay? And we also uh, look at this in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and uh, two. Okay, this prophecy was also fulfilled in Isaiah chapter nine, verses one and two. Can somebody read that, please? Isaiah chapter nine, verses one and two. Isaiah nine, one and two. N nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of the death, upon them a light has shined. Amen. So here's uh, uh, prophesying about Jesus Christ. And basically here, the, the uh, prophet Isaiah is saying that he's warning the people of Judah that the Assyrians are going to come and invade them and it's going to be really terrible for them. And we know that the invasion of the Assyrians was terrible for the Jewish people, especially for those who are living in the northern part of the promised land, the northern regions. That is the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, which is very close to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, But even though there's doom and destruction that was pronounced for the people of the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but you know, see how gracious and good God is. He's saying, hey, you people will be destroyed because of your sin. But he's saying there will be a time, you know, um, uh, when there will these people, the same people will see a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shine so what is he prophesying you are going to be captives taken as captives to um you know um uh, to assyria there's going to be great distress great agony there was the invasion of the assyrians was so terrible but he's promising that there will come a messiah who would redeem you Okay, so he says the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. That means he's promising these lands of uh, Naf uh, Zebulun and Naphtali that is around the Sea of Galilee, that even though they're going to be severely ravaged by the Assyrians, you know, that, that there will be a promise for this land. There will be a day when they will see special blessings. Okay, and he's saying that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light upon them has light shine means he's saying that the same tribes of zebulun and naphtali were going to suffer under the assyrian invasion god is going to show them mercy they are going to be the first ones to see the light of the messiah okay and we see that this matthew also quotes this passage and he very clearly says you know jesus's ministry started where in Galilee, right? The Galilean ministry of Jesus. 
and we see that the majority of Jesus' ministry took place in the northern area of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And we see that these people certainly did have special blessings because the light of the world, you know, was revealed to them and they were, you know, the, the people who were privileged to see this Messiah, okay? So even though they were promised uh, doom and destruction, but these were the same tribes who were the same people who were able to witness the light of the Messiah, to see his miracles and also, you know, uh, the light that shone through the Messiah was witnessed by people who were living around the Sea of Galilee. So another beautiful thing that we can take away from today's lesson is even though we have a God who is a God who is, um, you know, zealous, jealous God for his holiness, he punishes sin, but he's also a God who's gracious, merciful. He promises restoration. He promises, um, uh, you know, to restore us when we come back to him, just like he promises here in um, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, for the, uh, the tribes of uh, Naphtali and um, Zebulun. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll look at the third aspect uh, of the servant song um, that we looked in Isaiah chapter 42 in the next class. Sorry, we couldn't ask any questions. Anyone has any questions before we end class? Any questions? When it, the blood for blood covenant, when was it? Uh, it was during the Old Testament times. Yes. Yeah. Okay, if there are no questions, thank you everyone for joining today's class. Have a blessed weekend and enjoy your weekend, a restful weekend, and see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Sanjay, Lucy, Daniel. Thank you, everyone.